The third Home Rule Bill in 1912 promised a greater level of self-government. It caused an upsurge in nationalist activity. The North galvanized in opposition to Home Rule, forming the Ulster Volunteer Force. Over 3,000 women joined. Prompted by the Northern example, the Irish Nationalist Volunteer Force was set up in Dublin. At their inaugural meeting in 1913, President Owen McNeill promised there would be work for the women. But the women were not content to take on a supporting role to the men. And Cumann the Mon was set up in April 1914 as a militant and extremist movement gearing itself for war. When Cumann the Mon first marched, they were pelted with mud and ridiculed. We are not the handmaidens or camp followers of the volunteers. We are their allies. The aims of Cumann the Mon were to advance the cause of Irish liberty and to assist in arming a body of Irish men. With Markovich as president, Common Naman set up the Defence of Ireland Fund to raise money to buy arms. It was the idea of the Honourable Mary Spring Rice to smuggle arms in from Germany with the help of Erskine Childers and his wife Molly. They used Childers' yacht, the Asgard. In July 1914, after a 19-day voyage, they landed 900 rifles and 29,000 rounds of ammunition at Hoth, County Dublin. Britain was at war at the end of August 1914, and the Home Rule Bill was postponed once again. John Redmond, leader of the Home Rule Party, called on the volunteers to fight for Britain in the Great War. This caused a split amongst the volunteers. The majority supported Redmond and went to fight for Britain. Come and the Morn were opposed to fighting for Britain and no branch of the organization supported Redmond. They issued the statement at the convention of 1914. We came into being to advance the cause of Irish liberty. We feel bound to make the pronouncement that to urge or encourage Irish volunteers to enlist in the British Army cannot, under any circumstances, be regarded as consistent with our work. Donovan Ross's funeral was the biggest nationalist demonstration Ireland had seen in years. The funeral committee represented all the nationalist groups, and for the first time, Common Amon was included. The nationalist movement had a new generation of inspired and committed men and women. They were setting the stage for a rebellion against Britain. At the graveside, Patrick Pearce made his famous speech stating that Ireland on free would never be at peace. Women were also impatient for Irish freedom. Common Amon was growing in force. By 1915, there were more than 60 branches in Ireland. Membership had doubled.
Along with their peers in the Irish Citizen Army and the Irish Volunteers, Common Amon was gearing up for a strike against Britain. Many women worked from the basement of Liberty Hall, which had become an ammunition store. Connolly had a scheme which I think worked very well. There was a very big blackboard outside, about six feet by three, outside the front door of Liberty Hall, on which every week and every Saturday there were flamboyant notices chalked. Assembly tomorrow, full equipment for an attack on Wellington Barracks. And another week it would be attack on some other barracks. These are all fictitious. We went on road marches. We didn't make any attack anywhere. But I said one day to Connolly, I said, why do you put out these notices that, that don't mean anything, only turning the eyes of the police on us? And he smiled and said, ah, did you never hear the story of Wolf, Wolf, Wolf? For two weeks leading up to Easter, Helena Maloney and her co-worker, Ginny Shanahan, slept in Liberty Hall every night. In their room, they made the first tricolors for the rising. According to Maloney, we didn't get definite instructions of the rising. Our little group was on the alert the whole time. It was on the Saturday afternoon before Easter that we left Belfast to go to Tyrone. And then a messenger came and said they were looking for Miss Connolly. I was met by two men who told me they were from Dublin. They told me that there'd be no fighting in Tyrone. So I decided I had no choice. I was to go on to Dublin if there was no fighting in Tyrone. What happened to Nora Connolly that Saturday morning was echoed all over the country. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, now known as the Military Council under Patrick Pearce, had forged a document to dupe MacNeil into authorizing a rising. That Saturday, with just one day to go before the planned rising, MacNeil had discovered the document was a forgery and sent out orders cancelling all marches, parades and maneuvers. We arrived in Dublin about six o'clock in the morning and I walked over to Liberty Hall and when I went in there was my father on a little cot in the middle of the room. He wasn't asleep. He turned and he looked at me. He said, what are you doing here, Nora? So I told him what had happened and I said to him, Daddy, what does it mean? We're not going to fight. And he turned to me and two big tears rolled down his cheeks. He says, if we go to fight, Nora, we can only pray for an earthquake to come and swallow us and our shame. MacNeil's actions would overshadow all that followed. The discussions that took place in Liberty Hall were heartbreaking, with many of the volunteers and Irish Citizen Army saying that they would fight single-handed if necessary. The military council decided to go ahead with the rising and sent out couriers countermanding MacNeil's orders. Many of the couriers were women. Nora Connolly returned to Belfast with the message that the rising would go ahead on Easter Monday. But for many, the new order would come too late, for they had already demobilized. The news was rushed about. The volunteers had taken the GPO. They were in possession of several other places in the city. It was easy enough to get down O'Connor Street still, and I made my way to the GPO and asked the volunteer on guard to let me in to speak to Padraig Pierce, who was the only one of the leaders that I knew personally. I was brought to Pierce and had the temerity to tell him that I thought the rebellion was very wrong, as it would certainly fail but that I wished to be there if there was going to be anything doing. The first shot was fired at Dublin Castle. 
Helena Maloney was there with a party of nine girls from the Irish Citizen Army. Under the command of John Connolly, they took over the city hall. Later, they would be joined by the chief medical officer with the Irish Citizen Army, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. At both one of them, we were on the roof. Several men and I and some girls and uh, John Connolly, and he was struck with a bullet. It was firing, you see, from the castle and from the roof of the houses opposite. And by that time, Dr. Lynn had arrived downstairs, and she came up, and she said, I'm afraid he's going. So he lasted a couple of minutes. I said a prayer into his ear as he went, and he was, he was dead. When carrying dispatches to the GPO, I saw the charge of the 5th Lancers down O'Connell Street and their repulse by fire from the GPO garrison. I also saw the hoisting of the tricolour on the GPO. On my return from the GPO, I saw Madame Markovic and William Partridge turn back a column of British soldiers who were advancing down Harcourt Street. Madame had shot the two officers at the head of the column. Monday night we spent in Stevens Green. On Tuesday morning, we realized that our position was untenable, as British troops had succeeded in gaining possession of the Sheldon Hotel and were firing on us from the roof. Before we left the green, we lost one of our men, James Fox, who a few moments before had been singing, wrap the green flag around me, boys. We then evacuated the green and took possession of the College of Surgeons. Margaret Skinner, a 23-year-old school teacher from Glasgow, was part of the 138-strong Stevens Green Battalion. Her friend, Countess Markovich, was second in command under Michael Mallon. Over 200 women took part in the rising, stationed at all major outposts in the city, except Boland's Mill. Well, now, as everybody knows by this time, in Boland's Mills, there were no common among, although they had waited on Mount Street Bridge to be called. And de Valera didn't approve of having girls from, I think he didn't want to put them in danger. And so there were no girls there, no women of any kind. Towards nightfall, they, they attacked the, the windows at the back of the city hall, which led out of the castle yard. There was an attack on that, and they evidently got in through one of the lower windows because we heard a call, surrender. And that was repeated because the plaster was falling in showers from the roof as a result of the firing on the city hall, you see. And um, we were taken out one by one through the window at the back and taken prisoner. Fire raged through the city and by Friday the GPO was in flames. Pierce called on the 40 women stationed there and asked them to leave. By about Thursday, the front of the GPO had been set on fire. On Friday evening, a party of about 12 of us, five or six girls, a handful of wounded men of whom only one was unable to walk, were told to get out of the back of the GPO and make our way to Jervis Street Hospital. It must have been just about that time that the garrison led by Pierce and the others got out into Henry Street and over to Moore Street. Three women chose to remain with the leaders of the Rising. Julia Grennan, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Winnie Carney. With the wounded James Connolly on a stretcher, they made their way through the blaze to a little house on Moore Street. 230 innocent civilians, including 28 children, had been killed in the fighting. On Friday night, Sean McDermott asked Elizabeth O'Farrell to make a white flag. Later, it was decided that she would deliver the surrender note. I left the house with a verbal message from Commandant Pierce to the commander of the British forces to the effect that he wished to treat with them. I waved the small white flag which I carried, and the military ceased firing. The next day, at 3.30, she stood by Patrick Pierce's side while he surrendered. In photographs of that surrender, Elizabeth O'Farrell was literally airbrushed out.
Only her feet can be seen next to Pierce's. The leaders of the Rising were marched away, leaving Elizabeth O'Farrell alone to take the surrender note to the rest of the garrisons. Heavy fire still raged through the city, and her journey would take her two days. She was turned away at some of the outposts, as the men were not prepared to take the note of surrender from a woman. We were all marched under military escort to Richmond Barracks. The girls were singing all the time amidst the insults of the soldiers and the people along the route. We never had the British to protect us before. But luckily, the soldiers guarded us very heavily. Because when the gates were opened and we were marched out, there were such shrieks of hatred. Never did I see such savage women. A lot of it seemed to be directed against the Countess's breeches and putties. 77 women were among the prisoners that passed through Richmond Barracks. The women were then taken to Kilmainham Jail. The leaders of the Rising, including Countess Markovich, were court-martialed and sentenced to death. Most of the women were released after a week. Others were deported to England, where they were imprisoned or placed under house arrest. The Countess's sentence was later commuted to life in prison. There were also women imprisoned who had played no part in the Rising. Annie Higgins, Countess Plunkett, Nell Humphreys, Marie Perros, Kathleen Brown, Odell Ryan. They were held for four months without trial. We were put into a disused wing, the women, and evidently all the other men who had surrendered in the meantime outside were brought in there, and the, the men were executed, the executed men. Were you there when they executed? And we were, and heard it every morning from our cell. At it. I knew there was something sinister in the sound of those bullets. I knew I said to myself, they're shooting them, they're shooting the prisoners. Nellie Gifford, a young girl stationed at the College of Surgeons during the Rising, was now in prison. Her sister Muriel was married to Thomas McDonough, one of the leaders sentenced to death. Her other sister, Grace, was the fiancé of Joseph Plunkett, also to be executed. I was staying with my sister Muriel at the time. She was Tom McDonough's wife, and she was alone with the two children. I remember going to get the papers, and there was the news that Patrick Pierce and Tom had been executed. The next morning, although we'd been up all night, I woke as if been pulled out of the bed by an unforeseen force. I had no notion what I was doing, except I was being pulled on. I went then to Kilmainham to see Joe. After five hours, I was let in to see him. The prison chaplain married us. I was brought in and put in front of the altar. Then Joe was brought down the steps and the cuffs were taken off him. And the chaplain went on with the ceremony. I was not alone with him, not for one minute. I had no private conversation with him at all. So when we got in to my father, he said, well, Lily, he said, I suppose you know what this means. Oh, no, not that, he said, yes, Lily. She broke down then and she said, your beautiful life, James. She says, your beautiful life. And he said, wasn't it full life, Lillian? Isn't this a good end? And she broke, but she still cried. So he says, look, Lily, please don't cry. He says, you'll unman me. So she tried to control herself. I was trying to control myself, too. And we were there. She said, I talked about it. Things. He was trying to plan her a life for him after he was gone, and then they told us time was up and we'd have to go. He was 
used to be shot at dawn, you see. Well, we heard of the executions, and of course that horrified people, because we, in, in every chapter of Irish history, we should be accustomed to hearing of ruthless acts. But uh, uh, this was another. If England wanted Ireland, why had she no kindness towards them? Why had she no kindness? 